Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jason. Um, and in this video, I'll be going through task two of the data and Z program that is on the Forage website. Uh, this video is part two of a two part series. So if you haven't already watched the first part, um, I would highly suggest that you go watch that video first and come back to this video. Uh, I'll put a link somewhere up here. So that link will bring you to uh, task one of this program. And once you finish watching that video, you can come back to uh, this video. Uh, so in this video, um, I'll be going through task two, which is called predictive analytics. Uh, so in this task, we are required to explore correlations between customer attributes, uh, build a regression model, as well as a decision tree model based on our findings. Uh, and what we're looking at now is the official Forage uh, webpage for task two. Uh, let's now scroll down to uh, briefly read through some of the instructions that we have. Uh, so first we have uh, some background information. Uh, if you have completed task one, this should look very familiar uh, because this is exactly the same. Uh, to summarize, uh, the data set that we're provided with contains three months worth of transactions for 100 hypothetical customers at AMZ. Uh, it contains purchases, recurring transactions, as well as salary transactions. Um, and in terms of the specific tasks that we're required to complete uh, for task two, uh, first we need to explore correlations between annual salary um, and various customer attributes, for example, age. Uh, next, we need to build a simple regression model in order to predict the annual salary for each customer. Uh, and last but not least, we need to evaluate how accurate our model is um, and recommend to ANZ whether or not uh, it's suitable uh, to segment customers uh, into different income brackets for reporting purposes. All right, um, and further down, you have the data set that you can, that you can download into a computer. Uh, but because we've already completed task one, uh, what we can do is uh, simply use the uh, data file that we've uh, saved from our previous uh, task um, and simply just use that file for uh, task two. Uh, without further ado, let's now hop on to the actual uh, workbook itself. Uh, you will be able to find this workbook uh, up on my GitHub. I'll make sure to put a link in the video description. Um, and on there, you also find the notebook that I've used for task one. Uh, feel free to use that as a reference. Uh, all right, so let's begin. Uh, in the first cell, as usual, we need to import all the libraries that uh, we're going to use for this uh, particular task. Um, and I've split the different libraries into many two parts here. So the first part is called data wrangling. Uh, so firstly, we have pandas, uh, numpy, cbon, matplotlib. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, statistics. And in the next group of libraries, I've labeled them as machine learning. Um, I won't go through these libraries um, individually, but I will briefly explain what they do as we encounter them uh, later on in the workbook. Um, and so what we're going to do now is uh, actually load the data file uh, from our previous exercise uh, into our current workbook uh, and simply print out the first five rows of uh, the data frame. Uh, so recall that each row in our data frame represents a single transaction made by a particular customer. Uh, so these are the first five transactions of, uh, of our data frame. Uh, and if we want to have a look at the data frame columns, we can use the pandas data frame uh, and simply just output the names of the columns. And recall from task one, the uh, final four columns are actually what we uh, came up with individually. And so if you skip task one and are unsure about how I came up with these uh, four columns, um, I highly recommend that you go watch um, the video that I put out uh, for task one. Um, and in that video, I explain in detail how I came up with uh, these four columns. So month, uh, day of week, hour, and category. All right, let's now move on. Uh, so in this next section, um, we're gonna perform some feature engineering. Uh, in order to model annual salary, we first need to compute the annual salary for each customer. Um, and then following that, we need to create features that can help us predict uh, these annual salaries. Uh, so what we're gonna do uh, in this first uh, section on the feature engineering, um, we're gonna come up with our target variable. Uh, that is the customer's annual salary. Uh, a target variable, or sometimes called a response variable, uh, is a variable uh, that we are trying to predict. Um, and in our case, we're trying to predict the annual salary for each uh, ANZ customer. And so what we need to do first is actually collect all the unique customer IDs uh, and put them into a data frame. Uh, and that's exactly what I've done here. So the first five uh, customer IDs are as follows. Uh, and each customer ID obviously represents a unique uh, customer. Um, and in the next cell, I have an, uh, a data frame called example. Uh, don't worry too much about this. Uh, let's just move down to the uh, next cell. If this chunk of code looks a little bit intimidating, uh, don't worry, I'll try my best to explain them. So what I'm doing here is go through each of the unique customer IDs that we've identified um, and pick out the transactions that are related to pay and salary. And so what we want is both the date as well as the amount column. And next we want to group all the transactions by date uh, and apply the sum function to the amount column. 
So what that's going to do is we've successfully summed up all the salary transactions for each of the unique dates. Um, and next what I've done is count uh, those unique salary payments. If the count is zero, I want to append both of these lists called DF frequency and DF amount as uh, not a number, so uh, null values. Uh, if it's not zero, uh, I want to work out what the day between um, each payment is, um, i.e. what's the gap between uh, the salary payments. So the goal for this particular exercise is we're trying to work out what is the frequency that each of the customers get paid, uh, whether that is weekly or fortnightly. So the way we will go about this is taking the salary date and subtracting the previous uh, salary date, and we want to compute the number of days between those two transactions. And once we've collected all the days between salary payments, uh, we want to take the maximum of those days uh, and simply append them to uh, df underscore frequency. As for the salary amount, we want to take the mode, um, and the assumption that we're making here is that we're assuming that uh, the salary that gets paid most frequent uh, that is the amount of salary that the, uh, that particular customer gets paid every single week or every single fortnight. So what we just did was only for one single customer. Uh, we need to repeat the whole process for all 100 customers. And that is what the for loop is uh, doing here. Um, and once we've uh, completed all that, we can now move on to um, actually calculating the annual salary. Um, and the way we will go about doing that is taking the salary amount uh, divided by the salary frequency um, and multiplying by 365.25. Putting all the information into a single data frame, and let's have a look at the first uh, five rows. So each row in this uh, data frame represents a unique customer. Looking at the salary frequency column, we can see that the first three customers are paid weekly, and the fourth customer is paid every fortnight, and so on and so forth. And under the salary amount column, we can observe the different amounts that are being paid out on a weekly basis, um, or in the uh, fourth customer's case, every fortnight. And finally, we have the annual salary column for each one of those 100 customers. So now that we have our target variable, that is the annual salary for each customer, uh, we can now move on to creating predictive variables about features. Uh, and these are features that will help us to predict the annual salary for each customer. Uh, so in this section, um, we will create the following features for each customer. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, feel free to use your creativity uh, and come up with uh, features that you think might be useful to predict uh, the annual salary for each customer. But personally, these are the features that I have come up with. Uh, so first we have average number of weekly transactions, uh, followed by maximum transaction amount, number of large transactions that are over $100, number of days with transactions, average transaction amount, the median balance, as well as the state of residence. And also not to forget from our original data frame, we also have the age as well as the gender columns. So these are all the predictive variables that we plan on including um, in our modeling process. But before we move on to that, here I've created a list which contains all the unique customer IDs. All right, let's begin with our first predictive variable called average number of weekly transactions. Here I have a follow which will loop through every unique customer ID. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to repeat the process for each of the uh, unique customers. So in order for us to work out what the average number of weekly transactions is, uh, we need to take the number of uh, transactions that uh, this particular customer has made uh, divided by the unique dates uh, and multiply by seven. Uh, and we want to put everything into um, a, a list. And these are the first uh, five elements of that particular list. Um, and moving on, the next predictive variable that we have is the maximum amount. Uh, this one is relatively straightforward. Um, again, we have a for loop uh, which will loop through every single unique customer ID. Uh, essentially what we want is collect the amount column um, and simply take the maximum of uh, those amounts. Um, and again, put everything into a list. Um, and next we have the number of large transactions. Um, here I've defined large transactions as um, any transactions that are beyond uh, the amount of $100. We need a follow that is gonna loop through every single customer. Um, and we want to look at the amount column. Here I have a count variable which starts from zero. Every time we see an amount that exceeds 100, uh, we want to add uh, one to that particular account. Um, and once we've completed that process for one customer, we want to include that information into our list um, and move on to the next customer and so on and so forth. Um, and moving on to our fourth predictive variable called number of days with transaction. Here we want to pay attention to the date column and we want to apply the end unique function to the dates and simply include that information for each customer um, into the list. Uh, moving on, the average transaction amount. Uh, here we need the amount column 
and simply applying the mean to the amount column um, and store everything into that list. Uh, next, we have median balance. And unsurprisingly, the uh, column that we require is the balance column. And we want to apply the median function to the balance column. Uh, last but not least, the final predictive variable that uh, we want to create is the state of residence. Um, and here I've made a simple assumption, and that is that we assume customers live in the state uh, where most of their transactions occur. Um, and therefore, the column that we want to pay attention to is the merchant state column. Um, and then we will proceed to apply the mode um, function to the merchant state. This is going to allow us to work out the most frequent merchant state for each customer. And once we have completed that for every single customer, we want to put all those information um, into a list. Um, and following that, we are going to simply include both the age and gender column from uh, our original data frame. Um, I won't go through this because uh, this is quite straightforward. Once we have created all the predictor variables, uh, we want to put everything together into a single pandas data frame. All the way from the left, we have the customer ID column, followed by the average number of weekly transactions, the maximum amount, number of large transactions, average transaction amount, median balance, uh, the state of residence, as well as the age and uh, gender. And what we can do next is uh, simply concatenate the annual salary column that we have uh, created from early on um, and put everything together into a final uh, data frame. Uh, so this is what our final data frame looks like. Uh, so we have all the uh, predictor variables in the middle and our target variable called annual salary is at the very end. And so this is our final data frame that we're going to use uh, for our modeling. Uh, next, what I've done is simply just check for missing values. And so as you can see here, there are no missing values. Um, and therefore, uh, our final data frame is now ready for some minor pre-processing. Um, and then we're good to go with uh, the modeling process. The next section is called pre-processing. Um, and in this section, we will perform train test split um, on our final data frame, um, as well as construct a column transformer, uh, which consists of one hot encoder um, and a standard scalar. So beginning with uh, train test split, if you're unfamiliar with uh, train test split, um, it is essentially a pre-processing step um, where we split our final data frame into two parts. Uh, the first part is what we call a training set. Uh, so training set is what we use to train and build a model. Um, and test set, on the other hand, is what we use to evaluate the accuracy of a model. All right, so here I've chosen 70% uh, of our data frame goes into the training set um, and the remaining 30% will form our test set, which is used to assess the accuracy of our model predictions. So in the first cell, I have included all the columns in the final data frame, excluding customer ID and excluding annual salary uh, into a variable called X. And here I've also defined Y as our target variable, uh, that is the annual salary column in our final data frame. And so if we examine their respective shape, uh, here we can observe that X has uh, 100 rows and eight columns. Uh, on the other hand, for Y, we have 100 rows um, and a single column. All right, so next is where we will perform our train test split. Uh, here, I've specified my test set as uh, 30%. Um, and once we have completed train test split, um, it is always a good idea for us to examine the shape again, uh, just to make sure that they are aligned with our expectations. Uh, so for X train, we have uh, 70 rows and eight columns. Um, and Y train, we have uh, 70 rows. So both X train and Y train is what we will feed into our model in order to train them. Um, and then we will use X test and Y test to evaluate uh, the accuracy of our model. Um, and in terms of X test, we have 30 rows and eight columns. Um, and for Y test, we have 30 rows and a single column. All right, uh, moving on, we have the column transformer, uh, which consists of one hot encoder and standard scalar. Uh, because models cannot train on variables that contain text, uh, we need to encode both the state uh, and the gender columns using something called a one hot encoder. So what one hot encoder does is simply turn variables that contain text um, into uh, numerical values. Uh, furthermore, uh, to ensure that each feature contributes proportionally to our final prediction, uh, we also need to scale all the numerical variables uh, via a standard scalar. In order for us to build our column transformer, we first need to instantiate uh, both our one hot encoder as well as our standard scalar. If you're unfamiliar with the make column transformer function, uh, this is how it works. So here I'm specifying that I want to apply the one hot encoder to both the state as well as the gender column. Um, and I also want to apply the standard scalar uh, to the remaining uh, columns that I have in the data frame. Once we have completed that step, um, our column transformer is now ready to be used. 
Um, and so therefore we can now move on to the final section of this workbook and that is modeling the customer's annual salary. Uh, and my note here says that uh, now that our column transformer is ready, uh, we can proceed to build a pipeline using the column transformer um, as well as a machine learning model um, in order for us to predict the customer's uh, annual salary. So in the instructions, we were told specifically to try out two different models. Uh, firstly, we have linear regression, um, and secondly, we have the decision tree model. Uh, so let's begin with linear regression. Uh, first, we need to instantiate our linear regression model. Um, next, we can uh, instantiate a pipeline, which consists of the column transformer that we've just created, um, as well as our linear regression model. Um, and then what we can do is simply fit uh, the model to our training set, which consists of X train and Y train. Um, and once the pipeline has been fit, uh, we want to apply the pipeline and predict on the data in the X test uh, variable. And once the model has made those predictions, uh, we want to evaluate the root mean square error between those predictions, um, as well as the actual uh, values in the Y test variable. Um, and so the root mean square error for the linear regression model is around 28,000. But before we discuss this result, uh, why don't we move on to our second model, that is the decision tree model. So here we're repeating the process again. Uh, we want to instantiate our decision tree model, construct a pipeline which consists of the column transformer, um, as well as our decision tree model. Once the pipeline has been fit, uh, we want to predict the values that are in X test. Um, and the root mean square error for um, our decision tree model is around 20,000. All right, so to wrap up everything, we have our conclusion. Uh, the root mean square error for both models are above uh, 20,000. And although the decision tree model performed better than the linear regression model by having a smaller root mean square error, both models still appear to be highly inaccurate. And so therefore it's risky for us to use them to predict the customer's income bracket. Uh, more data is required to develop a more reliable model. Uh, nevertheless, what I just went through in this video is not an exhaustive process in which you can uh, conduct your modeling. Uh, one can easily invest more time into um, coming up with more features um, or trying out different kinds of models um, or even performing feature selection in order to uh, choose the best features in order to feed these uh, machine learning models. However, I highly doubt that the result that you get from doing all of that uh, will be significantly different to what um, I got. Um, and that's because we only have a very limited amount of data available to us. Or in other words, we only have data for 100 uh, customers. And so if our goal is to build an extremely accurate model, uh, what we will recommend to ENZ is actually uh, to collect more data about our customers uh, so that we have a, a larger training set. All right, so that wraps up task two, um, as well as the overall data ENZ program. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy both the tutorial videos um, of me walking through my solution uh, for this particular program. If you did enjoy, please drop a like on the video, uh, subscribe to my channel, um, and share my content around with uh, your friends. Uh, who are currently doing the program or uh, who are interested in data analytics. Uh, with that said, uh, take care, keep learning, um, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye.